Well, allow me to welcome everyone this morning. How's everyone doing? Good. All right. I love hearing all the chatter and the chit chat and uh, some beautiful faces, of course. Uh, I want to open us up and open the service with a quick prayer. Well, Lord, we are so glad to be here. We're so thankful, God, that you have brought us to this place at this moment in time. And we want to, to worship you today, God. We want to enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. We want to bless you, God, to bless the Lord with all of our soul. That is all that is within us, God. And so help us, Lord, as we enter into your sanctuary to praise and worship you because you are good, you are God, and you are worthy. And everyone said, amen. 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 All right. Well, good morning. So I've had a bunch of questions, and I'm going to answer them all right now. Are you ready? Every question you've ever had is going to be answered right now. Tim's going to answer them. <laughs> no, a bunch of you have asked. We got a bunch of the results back from my doctors, so it's been a good week. We've learned a lot of stuff. So they found out that when I was in Mexico a couple of years ago at Tijuana, when we adopted that orphanage, um, that I picked up a parasite. So that is what's caused my body not to be able to absorb iron and all of the other things. So I've had that for several years. Um, so I've had that. They found out I have a severe, very severe allergy to wheat. So not like celiac disease or anything like that, but it mimics it. So I have to go gluten-free. I hate my life right now. <laughs> um, then they found my pancreas isn't working right, so they gave me some stuff for that, and then some kind of uh, infection in there that feeds off sugar, so I have to stop sugar for a while, which is another horrible thing. I can't, if it tastes good right now, I can't eat it. If it's like yard clippings, that's okay. I can, it's about what everything tastes like, so. But we made some progress on all of it, so it's a good thing. My numbers have actually been coming up that with the, the medicine they've got me on, so I haven't had to go and get any blood transfusions for almost two or three weeks now. So that's a big thing. Yeah, it was, I was losing a unit of blood every three days. So I was going in and getting at least two units a week within a one month span. I had 12 units of blood given to me. So it's a, it's a big deal. I was tired of getting jabbed and stuck and poked and prodded and not fun, but so we're figuring some things out and we're excited about it. And um, actually, we will not be here next week, so you're going to be stuck with a, a backup speaker who is Tim. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. You <laughs> changed your life, guaranteed. That's right. Life Change Sunday is what we're calling it. <laughs> we're uh, a friend of mine. Actually, do you guys remember a few years ago when God healed me of that esophageal cancer? So uh, the young man who was a very wealthy real estate guy in Cincinnati who paid for the two preachers to come in and pray over me when God healed me, uh, called me, what, a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, there's a revival going on in Georgia. And they've been seeing, we have a friend who went there. His wife had stage four cancer and God completely healed her. They've been seeing some crazy things like that. He said, God told me to call you and tell you I'm paying for your whole family's plane tickets, rental car, and hotel. You're going to Georgia. Uh, he said, now you got to go to the service. <laughs> so <laughs> um, they're like four hour long services. Um, they're amazing though. I've been watching some of them. They are, this revival has been going on 303 weeks um, down there. So they've been seeing some pretty amazing things. So we're excited about that. So that's where we'll be. We'll be in Atlanta uh, for that, outside of Atlanta, while uh, Tim is going to speak for us, and I appreciate that. But today's a special Sunday, and it's going to be something that we're going to do annually because it's something that's very important to me, and it's very important to our church. It's one of those things that we feel, felt like starting Faithway Church that we wanted this to be something that marked our church, something that we wanted to be about, something that we wanted to be known for, something that wanted, we wanted a part of our DNA. We've all been to churches and been at places where the money that comes in is used for the church. Got to pay for a building, got to pay for electric, got to pay for staff, got to pay for this, and we got to pay for that, and we got to pay for the other. And it's all focused on the people inside the church. 
And most churches, their budget's on the high side, 10% for outside the church. So we wanted to be a church that was marked by generosity, a church that was marked by serving our community, a church that's been marked by helping others. Because we don't have any of those expenses. We pay $100 a week to meet here. How awesome is that? Um, we've been able to save up quite a bit, a chunk of money. And we've been able to help people and do things. And it's awesome to not have to say, well, can we fit it into our budget this month to be able to help somebody? No, we've, God's blessed us. We've got money. We just meet needs. And I love that. And that's what we want our church to be like. So today is, we're calling Serve Sunday. And something we're going to do every year. And we're going to talk about how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community next year, the end of this year and starting into next year. And I'm really excited about it because serving is fun. I love being able to serve and serving is needed, but serving can be really messy. And that's kind of what we're talking about. You ever see the show Dirty Jobs? Some of the things that guy gets himself into are just absolutely am I I'm gagging watching it on TV. I can't imagine what it's like to actually be there. But this guy from 2003 micro all the way to 2020 did nine full seasons, 173 episodes of the dirtiest jobs that he could find. And what he would do is he would do his best at these jobs and he would go and he would go and help the, the employees, the workers, and they would give him jobs to do and he would have to do these jobs. And, and no matter how dirty, no matter how disgusting, how nasty, I mean, the guy ended up in sewers, dumpsters animal pens, and even underwater a few times I saw. But the whole idea of the show was to show us how many dirty jobs there are there and how few people really want to roll their sleeves up and do the jobs. During an interview, Micro said this, Dirt used to be a badge of honor. Dirt used to look like work. But we've scrubbed the dirt off the face of work and consequently we've created this suspicion of anything too dirty. He said, but everybody knows that without someone being willing to take on the difficult, messy, challenging jobs of the world, the life many of us enjoy today would disappear. There's a lot of things that people just don't want to do. And just like Dirty Jobs, the TV show, and by please do not misunderstand me, serving is not always a dirty job. I'm trying to get us, I'm going to parallel these two things for a minute and bring it together. So don't, don't, don't think I'm saying that. But God is looking for individuals that he can use to get our hands dirty. He's looking for some people to roll up their sleeves and to get to work for him. Because to be a follower of Jesus is to be one of the few who's willing to take on that kind of a job to get our hands dirty, to do something, not just sit back, fill a seat on Sunday and go to work on Monday through Saturday and forget about everybody around me, forget about my relationship with Christ, forget about serving, forget about all these things and just show up and be a seat warmer. I've been in churches full of seat warmers. I'm, I'm not interested in that. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I don't want to be, that's not what I want us to be. And I know that's not what you want us to be. We want to be someplace that makes a difference. We want to be ones who are willing to roll our sleeves up to do the job in a messed up and dirty world. See, to love people in the middle of their mess is to actually show care and concern to those who are hurting means that we're going to have to roll up our sleeves. We have to do something. We can't sit by and be bystanders. And it's not like God has this expectation of us and he doesn't give us a blueprint or a map to follow. It's not like he just expects us to do stuff and then expects us to figure it out. In fact, Jesus came to save us from our sins. We all know that. Why did Jesus come? To seek and to save the lost, right? We, we all know that verse so well, but he also came to show us how to live our life. It, the Christian life is not just about going to heaven. If it was, as soon as we get saved, every one of us would just go straight to heaven. But why didn't I just go straight to heaven when I got saved? That's a question. You can, you can talk. This isn't, if, if you're newer, or new, we, we talk here. It's not, this is not like church like you know it, where you sit in rows and we teach our kids, sit down, shut up, because they stay like that their whole life. We talk in church. Get to go serve others. Yeah. yeah. He left us here to do something. Yeah. Otherwise, we would just go straight to heaven when we get saved. But he left us here for a purpose. He gave us something to do. And he came to show us how we're supposed to roll our sleeves up and to do the work. What is Jesus? Jesus is our example. 
Why did Jesus come to earth? So I'm asking you this question. Why did Jesus come to earth? To save us. To save us? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons he came. Why else? Teach us. Teach us? He did. Definitely came to give us some phenomenal lessons and messages and teachings. Absolutely. Why else did he come? As a servant? As a servant? Definitely. I think to show the Father's heart. To show the Father's heart. That's a great one. Forgive us. Forgive us. Anybody else? All those are absolutely right. All those are scriptural. But did you know that Jesus actually told us in his own words why he came? Matthew 28 says this, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many. Why did Jesus come? Think about this. He came, he's talking to his disciples, he's explaining the goal of his life is not to just be on top, and that shouldn't be our goal either. It's not to, the point's not to be the most famous, the most powerful, the most rich, the most wealthy, the most anything like that. He's sitting his disciples down and he says, our goal is to serve. That's a win. That's what we should be striving for is to serve others. Putting ourselves last so we can put other for others first. That's a life worth living, Jesus is teaching us. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us by leaving heaven, coming here to this earth, and giving himself as a sacrifice on the cross. He did that to serve us so that we could have eternity with him. I mean, think about it. Jesus is the one who was here on earth, and he is the only person who could have ever rightfully demanded, every one of you serve me. I am the king of kings. You serve me. If anybody ever had a right to say that, he did, but did he do that? Absolutely not. He served others. Think about what it is to be a servant. When I think of a servant, man, there's a face that pops into my mind. Sean McEwen, Sean and Julia. Man, when I think about a servant, Sean and Julia's face just, man, I miss them. <laughs> I wish they were still lived here. I mean, instead of moving like they did and abandoning us. And <laughs> Sean, I know you said you watch. We're testing to see if you're actually watching. No. <laughs> but, but Sean and Julia, man, they, they, for over a year, every Sunday morning, they came and set all of this up so that we could come in and have church. I mean, they knew where every wire was, every plug, every everything. And they came in here. They would take all the stuff home in the back of their truck, store it, bring it in. All I had to do was come in with the computer and plug it in, and we went. They were servants. Never complained. Never asked for anything. They showed us what it was like to be a true servant. You see, in this story, it wasn't long after Jesus had this conversation with these disciples that he's sitting with them. And it's just, in fact, it's just a few hours before he's about to be betrayed, arrested, put on trial, and crucified. He's sitting there, and they get together to celebrate the Passover festival, which is to remember the blood that was put from the sacrificial lamb on the doorposts, the sides of the door, and the top of the door, representing the cross when the people of Israel were in Egypt. These homes covered by the blood on these door frames that spared the firstborn from being killed, from death. What a beautiful picture of Jesus on the top and the sides, a symbol of the cross and the basin at the bottom of blood. A beautiful picture of what Jesus was going to do, with, do for us, the sacrifice that he was going to make. They're sitting there, Jesus, his disciples, enjoying this final meal with each other. And Jesus did something that was kind of shocking. It's in John 13. It was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Let me stop there. Jesus had 12 followers. One of them was a devil. So out of every 12 of you, I'm just kidding. But you know what that tells me? The devil's comfortable in church. And he gets into church. And he causes havoc in churches today. If he could do it with Jesus there, you better believe he could do it today, right? So let me go on, verse 3, that's a whole other message. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water in a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel he had around him. 
During this meal, Jesus, I mean, they're together, they're celebrating the Passover, and all of a sudden Jesus stands up in the middle of this meal. He walks over and he picks up a bowl and he puts water in it and he takes a towel and wraps it around his waist. And this towel is by no means big enough for me to wrap around my waist, but it was the only towel I could find this morning. And then he begins to wash the disciples' feet and I am not washing your feet. I have this thing, feet are just gross to me. I, I can't handle it. Ditto. <laughs> Thanks, Ruby. That was not me. <laughs> oh, that was not Ruby. Oh, I'm with you, Em. <laughs> I can't do it. The disciples were definitely not expecting that. And it was an interesting thing that was going to happen, and we're going to talk about it. So what, is, what happens here? Jesus, our example, gives us some tools. This is the story. I'm giving you the story. This is all introduction. Then I'm going to give you a couple points, and we'll be done. Washing people's feet was a normal practice in Bible days. I think, again, super gross, but it was a custom. It was normal. And the reason was these people had to travel long distances, and these roads were not paved. They didn't have... You know, concrete, they didn't have blacktop, they didn't have cars, they didn't have trucks, they, they didn't even ride on horses most of the time. They had camels, or they walked, and it was very dusty, and it was very dirty, and they wore sandals, not shoes like what we have on today. So their feet would get very dirty. So they would come into a home, and they the, one of the first things that would happen was that a servant would come, not the homeowner, not the guest of honor, but a servant in this home would come up to them, take their shoes off, and wash their feet as they came into the home. Probably pretty dirty. Probably pretty smelly. Not a job that anybody would really want. So when the disciples saw Jesus coming around to do this, can somebody mute the computer? I forgot to. It's, it's getting my emails coming in. I'm very important, and a lot of important things happen on Sunday morning at this time. So um, it's on the top row. You might have to ask Noemi or Tim. I know that technology is. You are Captain America. Just turn the volume all the way down at the top. So they were not expecting Jesus, who's the guest of honor. He's the most important person there, to be the one who stands up and walks over and begins to wash their feet. He kneels down, rolls up his sleeves, and gets this bowl of water and towel. Again, that's the servant's job. Not the homeowner, not the guest, not the guest of honor. It's the servant. It's the person who is the least important person there's job to do it. So here's Jesus, the Messiah, who's come from heaven. He's God in the flesh with a bowl of water and a towel doing the job of a servant. Jesus was serving his disciples physically by washing their feet. But he's also representing something else that he was about to do. He was about to serve them by giving his life for them. See, the bottom line of feet washing in any shape or any form, it's going to cost you something. When we serve other people, it's going to cost us. It's not easy, and it's going to require humility. It costs, and it requires humility. I like history. You guys know that. I was reading a book about World War II not long ago, written by Donnie McCollum, and it's called Waking from the American Dream. Here's what it said. During World War II, England needed to increase its production of coal. Winston Churchill called together labor leaders to enlist their support. At the end of his presentation, he asked them to picture in their minds a parade, which he knew would be in Piccadilly Circus after the war. He brings all these people together. Picture this parade. First, he said, would come the sailors who kept the vital sea lanes open, parading down and everyone's cheering for them. Then would come the soldiers who had come home from Dunkirk and then gone on to defeat Rommel in Africa. Next would come the pilots who had driven the enemy from the sky. Last of all, he said, would come a long line of sweat-stained, soot-streaked men in miners, camp, miners' caps. Someone would cry from the crowd, and where were you during the critical days of our struggle? And from 10,000 throats would come the answer, we were deep in the earth, with our faces to the coal. 
Often the unsung heroes of the dirty work for the kingdom of God are the ones who have their faces to the coal. People who are willing to do the work. Jesus had every right to have someone else, anyone else, wash his feet. But instead, God in the flesh put his face to the coal and washed, his, washed the feet of the people that he loved. That story goes on in John 13, and it says this. I thought you muted that, Tim. <laughs> no, I mean, can you help, Tim? It's a Mac. I don't have experience on a Mac. Oh, it's a Mac. You see, there's a button that shows a picture of a speaker, and some lines get bigger, some lines get smaller. Thanks, Ruby. Leave it to someone who has... Never mind. John 13 goes on. When Jesus came to Simon Peter... Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands, my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Just like Peter, always opening his mouth without thinking. I can relate to that. I know many of you can too. Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. Remember what he just happened? The devil's in there. You're clean, but not all of you are clean. Um, he goes on. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That's what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. See, what Peter said proved that he didn't get it. He pipes up, and he didn't understand what Jesus was doing. And still, though, it was all about needing to be clean with Peter. Well, then just wash me all over. Just He missed the whole point. Jesus wanted to teach them to be servants. He wanted to teach them that they needed to do for others what he had been doing. And they had to be willing to do it. Here it is. Are you ready? Without recognition. How many times do we do something for somebody else and then we tell everybody else what we've done? Because why? Why? Humble. Yeah, we're not humble. <laughs> That's for sure. We want everybody to know. We want credit. Yeah, we want, we want everybody to know what we've done. Just serving because it was the thing that they were supposed to do. That's what Jesus was trying to teach them. So what was he doing? He was washing their feet. Jesus gave us the example, example to follow. We're to serve others. And that's why today serve Sunday. It's not just an option for people who consider themselves disciples of Jesus to serve. It's not optional for us. It's a part of the deal. If Jesus is going to be the one that we follow, then we have to stay in step with him by serving those around us. So where do we start? How do we begin to serve others? What does it mean to carry a bowl and a towel? What does this mean for us today? What is the bowl and what's the towel today? How do I scrub people's feet today? How do I serve others today? Well, the key is looking at Jesus' example. When we look at Jesus' example, we see practical ways that we can do it today. And all that's introduction. Here's the message. So we'll be here for another. Just kidding. Here's what we have to do. We have to look for needs around us. We've got to look for the needs. There are people who have needs everywhere. Jesus met a need by washing the dust from his disciples' feet. It was a practical, physical need that they had. It was something tangible, something that he could do to serve them. He saw a physical need, and he met it in a practical way. Saw the need, did it. That's what he did. So what are the needs that you see around you? See, the problem is we don't look. Have you looked at your neighbor's yard? Yes, Joe has. You and Joe checking yards out. Yep. 
it might be a neighbor who needs their grass mowed this time of year. It could be leaves raked. It could be snow shoveled because they can't do it on their own. Or you might live close to a single mom who has to go to work and needs somebody to watch their kid for a couple hours. <coughs> or maybe it's a family who got a cancer diagnosis who needs somebody to just provide a meal for them or help them get the meals and help them be able to be organized because they're not able to do it themselves. <laughs> or maybe it is an opportunity to go overseas and build houses for people who, or, you know, the poorest people in the world. You see, the thing is, when we allow the Holy Spirit to keep our spiritual senses awake and aware, we're going to see the needs around us. If we'll just ask, he'll show us. If when we get out of here today, if we ask God, hey, on my way home, Lord, would you just show me a need of somebody I could meet? And when you drive by it, don't think, oh, well, that's not a big one. I can't do that. Oh, well, that guy's sitting on the side of the interstate with a sign. He probably has a job, probably makes more money than me. It's a con. I'm not giving him anything, not doing anything for him. Well, go buy him a burger. Go buy him some food. Do something. And guess what? He doesn't even have to know you're a Christian. He doesn't need to know your name. He doesn't need to know your faith. He doesn't need to know your church. He just needs somebody to meet a need. We've got to be open and available. What else did Jesus teach us? Look for the needs and get rid of your pride. This is a tough one for us. Because what Jesus did took an incredible amount of humility. Our pride is one of the biggest barriers to serving regularly. We see people as an inconvenience. I, I don't want to be bothered by that. I'm... Do you know how much money I make? I'm going to go mow their grass. That, that'll take me three hours. You know how much money I could make at work? I'm too important for that. I don't need to be messing with that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm too, or maybe you see them as a threat because they don't think like us or they don't dress like us or they don't vote like us. So we look at them as something different, not important. But we're supposed to choose humil humility. We're supposed to step out of our comfort zone. We're supposed to serve our community. We've got to get rid of our pride so that we can make a difference. Pride is me needing people to know that I'm doing it too. Everybody has to know it was me. Otherwise, why would I give of my money? Why would I do something for them? If I'm not getting credit for it, if nobody's going to know it was me, then why should I do it? I have to make sure somebody knows. <laughs> I'm going to put a sign in their yard. Andy Schelling in Faithway Church mowed this grass. I like it. <laughs> you might like it, but I don't think Jesus does very much. And then Jesus teaches us that serving is going to cost us. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, it cost him. When he went to the cross, it cost him. We've got to understand that the life of a servant of Jesus is a life that's going to cost us something. It'll cost us financially. It'll cost us our time. It'll cost us our energy. It'll cost us emotionally because we're going to get tied up in it. We've got to be willing to pay the cost. Then we'll be able to reap the reward of seeing the world changed. If no one is willing to do it, who's going to do it? Ultimately, serving is about leadership. Those two things don't seem to go together, but Jesus is the ultimate leader. And somebody said, if serving is below you, then leading is beyond you. And that is so true. The world needs people. The world needs churches who are willing to roll their sleeves up and show their leadership ability by serving. But that's going to take intentional effort on our part. But that's how the world changes. You guys know I love D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody carried a note in his Bible that was a reminder to him to serve. Here's what the note in D.L. Moody's Bible says. This was in his Bible. It said, next to Isaiah 6, 8, D.L. Moody wrote this. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do... I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. See, we may only be one person, and we may not be able to help everybody, but we can help somebody. 
I may not be able to provide every need in my community, but I can provide somebody's needs. I may not be able to be Jesus for everybody, but I might be able to be Jesus for somebody and make a difference in their life. Here's the hard one. Our motive for serving is obedience, not recognition. This is the tough one. Out of all of them, this is the hardest. But Jesus, out of his very own mouth, talked about this. Here's what Jesus said. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to somebody in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do. Jesus says, if you do this, you're a hypocrite. Don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. Okay, how does that happen today? That's where I wear a t-shirt that says Faithway Church while I'm out cleaning up the sides of the street. Look at me. I'm wanting attention from people because I'm doing a serving thing. Oh, but that's just good advertising. But that's not what Jesus said. I'm supposed to serve with no expectation of anything because my reward comes from him, not from other people. It's the same thing is true when we share our faith. I share my faith with people and I witness to people and I invite people to come to church. But guess what? Those people don't always come to church. But guess who does come? God brings other people. See, when I'm faithful to do my part, he's faithful to do his part. That's faith. And we're supposed to be faith way church. We have faith that God will do his part if I do my part. That means if I serve in secret, he will reward openly. I don't have to get myself rewards. I don't have to prove what I'm doing. We don't have to prove what we're doing to anybody. Our father who sees and sees... Well, let me finish reading it. I jumped way ahead. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for then you'll lose your reward from your father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They've received all the reward they're going to get. I don't want that reward. I want that reward, right? That's why we do what we do. But when you give to someone in need, here it is. Here's how we're supposed to serve. Here's how we're supposed to meet needs. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. What's that mean? That means I don't tell anybody what I'm doing. That means I'm doing it in secret. Because why? Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. The old King James says to give your gifts in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I do my giving in secret because the only one who sees the secret is who? And then the one who sees in secret will rewards openly. It's an exact opposite mentality of what we have as American Christians today. We think I have to promote myself. I have to promote my church. I have to promote Christianity. I have to promote my denomination. I have to promote all these things so that everyone else will see us and want to be like us. No, Jesus says, just do it in secret. I'll take care of all that. That's why I said this is the hardest one. Because we are self-promoting people. And we want everybody to see what we do. And Jesus taught us when we give and when we serve, we do it because it's the right thing to do, because not for the recognition. I think Jesus would say the same thing to us if he's here today. We don't give for a PR bump. We don't serve for a PR bump. We don't give and serve so that someone will listen to it. We don't make a deal. What I'm, I'm about to say is not an insult to any church or any person because I love this church and I love this person. But there is a church that has a food pantry that will not open the food pantry to anybody unless they come to church first. You need to come to church first, then we'll open the food pantry afterwards so you can get some food. You got to come and listen to us preach, then we'll serve you. That's not what Jesus said. <coughs> you don't have to come and listen to Jesus preach in order to get healed, did you? Okay, two weeks ago we talked about Thanksgiving. Remember, we had the 10 lepers. Remember the story of the 10 lepers? We, talk, we just talked about it two weeks ago. 10 were there, they're crying out, Jesus, heal us. Okay, sit down, open your Bibles. Let me preach to you for about 15, I, I got 50 minutes, right? The average Baptist church is 45 to 50 minutes long. 
Some churches longer. Some, if it's a non-denominational church, sit down. We got a 10-minute one. <laughs> Depends on the church. I'm just kidding. Jesus didn't say that. What did he say? Go. Go to the priest. Show yourself. You're healed. One came back, and that's who Jesus talked to and interacted with. He, he met with him after, but the, the other people still get healed? <coughs> See, Jesus went about healing people everywhere he went, not only after he preached. He didn't witness to them and give them the ABCs, the Romans Road, and everything, and then meet their needs. He met their needs first. As he's walking down the road, Jesus, remember the blind man? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Okay, you're healed. Walking by the pool of Bethesda. Uh, just get up, take up your mat and walk. Okay, gets up, goes. Nowhere do we see Jesus preaching at somebody, trying to convert them or get them to do anything before he healed. He healed them. They had faith in him because they called out to him, yes. But he served before. And he's our example. We don't give and serve so that someone will listen to us. This is an amazing quote that I've heard a million times, and you probably have too, but Francis of Assisi wrote, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. That means everything I do preaches the gospel. Why? Because giving is a selfless, humbling thing. And a prideful person can't do it. A person who is not following after Jesus can't meet all these needs. Now, there are good people around who try to meet needs, but people will see the difference in us because there is something different about us because there's someone living inside of me. You ever had somebody or heard of somebody who just met? There's a, I could give you a million examples of this, but I'm not going to because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But someone looking at you and saying there's something different about that person? Even without preaching... We can make a difference without, and I'm not minimizing that because we have to share our faith. We're supposed to share our faith. But serving and giving is not a, pre or, or preaching and doing all that is not a prerequisite for being able to do this. We do this first. Jesus told us to be his hands and his feet. We're supposed to serve. We're supposed to make a difference. So this morning, what I'm asking you to jo do is to join us in practically meeting the needs of our community. So how do we do that? How do we meet the needs in our community? What needs does our community have? And here's the big question. Do people actually need to know that Faithway Church is the one who met their needs? No. I'd like to discuss that. You're welcome to. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> let's, let's just do it. Okay. Go ahead. I'm ready. All right. So Noemi and I actually talked about it. We, yes, we're absolutely right. We, we love to help and serve, and we want that part of our DNA. But I don't see anything wrong with letting somebody know that, um, that Faithway or Christians did this for you. I want to I demonstrate God's love to them. Mm -hmm. I don't want them just to think that it's some charity, secular charity, that just handed out checks to everybody. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's not any good either. There's I, a I, difference, I wanna though. Sh I want to I give credit to God, not mm -hmm. us, but I want to give credit to God. Like, out of our love for the Father... We want to do this for you. We want to love you and we want to care for you. So I don't see anything wrong with doing it. It's the, it's the motive and the heart behind it. Okay. Am I doing this because I want to, hey, our church is meeting the needs in the community? Or there's a difference. I don't have a problem with saying, hey, man, would you, you, you want to go to church with me sometime? This is where I go to church. But you know, that's a different thing. But we're talking about where I have to put my name on something and I have to tell everybody and we're only doing it because we want people to know that this is what we're doing. Because then Jesus said it, you've got your reward. You know, I, I don't, again, it goes back to what Jesus, uh, let's just go back to Jesus every single time. Let me go back. There it is. Jesus said it. Don't do your good deeds publicly. Is the, what does that mean? You know, I, I think it's, um, I think you mentioned this actually, but I, I think the biggest part of that passage has to do with, with our heart mm -hmm. and the motive and intention, right? You know, which is, which is difficult. Um, 
to read our own hearts yeah. and to, to measure our own intentions. But, you know, in Matthew 5, Jesus talks about let your light shine before men so that others may see your good deeds and then glorify your right. Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you've got this passage that talks about don't, don't do it to be seen. And so what that, the dichotomy there is that the difference is because one talks about the motive of being seen and one talks about the motive for God to be glorified. Yeah. And so if, if we're having conversations with people and it's an organic, kind of a natural thing for, for us to talk about, hey, you know, I'm, I'm out here with, with my church and we're just loving people and um, we wanted to bless you. I think at times that can be totally appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think there's other times where um, Pastor talks about don't let your le left hand know what your right hand is doing, where there's an element of trust that we can have in the Holy Spirit that, you know what, it doesn't matter if this person knows who I'm with, what I'm about, I'm going to bless them because that's, that's what God's heart is. And I'll trust that God... <clears throat> This can be, so in, in, I think it's in uh, Romans where Paul talks about, I planted, Apollos mm -hmm. watered, but God's the one that makes it grow. God gives the increase. Yep. Yeah. And, and there are times where we're planting, and, and I need to trust that even if this person doesn't know that I represent Jesus, I'm going to trust that God is going to give the increase, that I'm going to be part of this process. And it doesn't matter if I get recognition. I trust that God is going to do his part and make it grow down the road somewhere. And so I think it can be difficult because we want people, obviously, we want people to know that Jesus is the, yeah. the reason we're doing these things. Mm -hmm. But I need to trust that Jesus is going to communicate that to them at the same time, too. But if I feel prodded by God and the Holy Spirit in that moment to let this person know, this is an appropriate time for me to let this person know, hey, you know, I go to uh, it's a such and such church, and we would love to, to have you. If you decide not to, that's great too, but, you know, um, I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah, we're not doing this just so you'll come to our church. Right. Exactly. Totally we're agree. not doing this just so that you'll know it's us. Oh, yes. Very, very, very well said, Mark. Yeah, yeah, very well said. yeah go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to when he's talking about planting seeds, watering it, mm -hmm. and seeing the fruit, when you met me, you met me at a time <coughs> where the seed had been planted yeah. several years ago. People have been showing up for me without pressure for church because I made it very abundantly clear I was not interested. I was unapproachable. <coughs> and my spiritual walk, people knew not to bring it to me. Marcus knew not to bring it to me to a certain extent. When you met me at a time where the fruit was was ready to be to be to be born there, whatever <laughs> harvested, yeah, harvested, whatever. But you met me in that season. I I was in a place to hear that. If you had come to me at any other point in that process, you'd have gotten the hand the wall, everything else, and you would have been probably you know heartbroken that like you couldn't reach me. But that would have been a, it would have been a hard pass for me. But you reached me in a time where it, like, it made sense. And other synchronicities and things where we were both sitting there saying, like, this is a God thing. Yes. This this is, I'm supposed to be here. But the people we're talking about in this community, they haven't, most of them haven't had any seeds planted. Mm -hmm. These people just need people to show up for them just one time. Like, so that they, they have that. But a lot of them just want dignity, too. We're not talking about the soup kitchens. What you were mentioning is like, we don't want to give things and then wonder where it came from. I don't think that's really, in my opinion, what they need either. I think when we're talking about serving our community here, I grew up here, and these are my people. These people need to show up and take, alleviate something off of their plate so that they can put that attention somewhere else and work somewhere else in their life. But it needs to be, what do I call it? It's a privilege. It's something that I alleviate. I don't want people to come in here and see just a bunch of other needy families. I want them to sit and be standing right next to other people in their community that are also struggling with those things. And make them into the community as a whole. Like Tom, that's a really easy thing. Tom is very is, is physically disabled. That's a really easy thing to look at and be like, oh, he needs help. You know, it's really easy to put something on that. But you're not the people that you're going to serve are not people that are going to come out and tell you. 
they're not people that are gonna say like, my kids are eating box meals every night because I can't afford to feed them, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. These are families that aren't gonna come and tell you those things. They struggle with spouse. So you're talking about like even Tom's family still, we've helped them in other ways, but his wife still brings home fast food every single night. And that's what their kids are eating every single night. But when we're talking about not putting our name on it and everything like that, we could have them meeting in the same exact place that we're worshiping. We don't have to tell them who we are, but just people showing up for them, period, is something they're not used to. Yeah. Just showing up for them is going to lead them to want more. They're going to start just keep showing up. Then they're going to ask questions. That's, that's yeah. what happened with us. And then you're gonna, I'm going to present you with an opportunity to help me. Yeah. Right? It's going to create opportunities for them to want more, to ask questions. And I feel like it's the natural progression of things. Mm -hmm. is really what got me here, what's kept me here. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been to people's houses, we've been invited into things, we've wanted to go, and it's been years mm -hmm. since our family, well, our family has never participated in church that way as a whole, but before that, it's been years even beyond that since I have. So I feel like, in echoing that, I didn't feel pressured yeah. at all. I don't feel like I owe anybody anything. Yeah. And that's another mm -hmm. thing, you're talking about a lot of recycled trauma people here they're immediately gonna feel like they owe somebody a debt. Like, in the dignity part of them doing something for themselves, I think if we create opportunities for them to serve themselves, instead of us just serving and giving, there's other ways to do that, I think. And that's something that, you know, I brought to um, Andy the other day about different ways that we can serve, getting creative with how we do it. It doesn't have to be what we're used to doing. Yeah. The one time a year, where we take kind of the joyful part of yes. Because that almost feels more self-serving mm -hmm. for us than it does. Like, can you imagine being on the other side, like getting pre-wrapped gifts for your kids and just be like them opening up and like, oh, what'd you get? You know, like that doesn't, mm -hmm. for me and wind out, like that's not exactly mm -hmm. my way of like, I would like to serve them. So mm -hmm. this is actually coming at a time that I was already kind of on that same, Seriously. same yeah. thing. But it's just a different perspective. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't really been on that side in a while, and you're not, you know, communicating with those people consistently, it's not going to feel the same. And growing the church is a big deal, but I feel like growing it slowly towards the big goals, big picture things like what you're talking about is kind yeah. of the... Well, sorry for long speech, John. Yeah, no. no, that's great. That's why we want to eventually have our church in a community center. You know, if we're the ones that build the community center, I'm for it. But I don't want to have a church building that sits empty six days a week what a waste of God's money to spend millions of dollars on a building that doesn't get used. And then you got to maintain it and you got to heat it and nobody's ever in it. And it falls apart before it gets used hardly. I mean, that's why we've talked about that. What does that look like for us? Do we need to buy property and put a community center where people can come in? There's something after school for kids. There's this in there. There's that in there. And oh yeah, on Sundays, the church meets in there too. I think that's a way better use of money than us putting a building up with a steeple on it and saying, come here on Sundays. Amen. How much money? Something important to remember is that we need to look for ways to personally serve, not just mm -hmm. with an organization. Sometimes the only serving we ever do is just with our church, and it, we almost feel like, well, well we're just doing this because it's like... Yeah something our church is doing or something, but to, to actually have that personal serving, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Absolutely, Ruby. Well said. Well Dave? Said. I just, uh, <laughs> I, I want to make sure we always get the spiritual principle rather than just slapping another rule down. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, serve it while I'm wearing my Faithway shirt, bad. <laughs> yeah. You got bad buddies. <laughs> so if once I don't have that on, I'm, you know, I'm good. But, I mean, there's a spiritual principle there. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do it safely wearing our t-shirts or not yeah. depending on sort of what our heart motivation is there it is we can do a, we can do a lot of things personally not to do with the church we can do it with the church we can do it in a lot of ways mm -hmm. but we really do need to guard our heart the way jesus said and make sure our motives are, are pure as mm -hmm. much as we can uh, i just think we can if the lord really convicts us about not wearing the shirt okay I just use that as an illustration. Yeah, I, I know, I, that was not a hard fast. Don't ever do anything in your face <laughs> shirt. But it's so easy for us to walk away like, okay, yeah. I'm not going to do anything with my faith shirt on. Right. You know, uh, when that's not really a spiritual principle that you're emphasizing or Jesus is emphasizing. Yeah. Either. It's the same we're talking about the Ten Commandments going through that series. You know, the Ten Commandments had the law, and then Jesus came and fulfilled it, and it's all about the heart now. 
not about the outward, but about the inward man. And so this goes right along with that. It's the inward man. God's looking at our motives, why we're doing it. Am I just trying to appease my conscience? Am I trying to build a name for this? Or, what, or, or am I doing it truly because I'm supposed to be a servant and I really have the wants, needs, and, and the best interest of that person or this person in mind? Am I serving them because I love them like Jesus told me to love them? Or am I serving them because I want to fill a room up with people and be able to brag about it? So very, very well said, Dave. Very well said, Dave. Yes, ma'am. When I sit here and I think about, so I'm thinking about like what a cool thing it would be to go to the, a, a Salvation Army card store or a grocery store or something. Mm-hmm. Get like grocery store gift cards and, 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 and find people that you think look like they might need some help. I mean, I know that you can't tell always, but I, I don't see anything wrong with like having a, a telling them we want, we, I, I want to let them know we're here for them. Mm-hmm. So What's that motives would, thing? It's right, why I'm like doing it. Let, we would like to bless you with this hey, gift. Hey, you, know, hey. or, you know, I don't know your story, but I'd like to know your story. And we, mm-hmm. you know, we're from this church. No pressure. You know, it's just that if, if they want them to know what it comes. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's kind of a hard. I mean, I would never want to give it to somebody just to and that's why we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Mm-hmm. He's the one who has to lead me to the right person. And it's about like what would Rachel go. Rachel said too about this, you know, and Marcus, you know, maybe it's the right time for me to talk to you. Maybe it's just the right time for me to give it to you and let the Holy Spirit tell you. Maybe it's the right time and the Holy Spirit will tell me it's time to say something to that person. Because I sit there and I think about like my that's childhood right. and I think of my mom and mm-hmm. having a big support system. I, mean, I wish uh, there would have been a good church that would have been there for my mother, you know. So mm-hmm. that's the kind of stuff I think about. Like, I would want to see if there's a woman or a father out there that's a single parent that needs some, some kind of group around them. Like, I want them to know where to come. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess I put myself in their place. Like, you know, I want to be there. I want someone mm-hmm. to help them. Because, you know, I've been through it where people aren't there. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Your family. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, so I think, you know, I don't know if everybody knows who I am or, you know, Tom is the guy that I help. Um, you know, I'm very, um, I help a lot of people in our community. I serve a lot of people mm-hmm. and I'm known for that, but it's, and I'm referred, a lot of people are referred to me just for random odd things, and it's, but it's because of the relationships that mm-hmm. I have. I don't just one off, you know, hand something out or go to somebody. Not that I don't think there's time and place for those things, but it's the follow up, the follow through. I check in with these people constantly. Um, I'm a safe space for them. And I let people know up front, like, I don't, and I ask them straight up out the, the gate. I'm like, I don't know if you're spiritual or not. Um, you know, I love God and I love people, and everything else falls under that. I don't have to associate myself with anybody other than mm-hmm. God. Um, but then I just serve them. And that is it. They let me know, like, oh, you know what? I have had, I grew up this way. But I'm like, okay, cool, that's great. We're on the same page. But I put it out there in the front. So then everything else I have, I do after. They can affiliate with whatever they want. But, like, there's a, a very clear line of, that I set out in the front that I, I, I love Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I love people. And that's, that's where everything else stems from. That always leads to conversations. It mm-hmm. leads them to, and they, they continuously come back because I show up. I follow through and, and I follow up with them and I do genuinely care about them um, and I build a relationship with them and that's what leads them to trusting me to tell them what they're struggling with so I can help them more mm-hmm. or bring the church in and have more opportunities. <coughs> I think that we get stuck on a lot of like the way that we have been in the past. A lot of churches, not we specifically, but churches are <coughs> around the holidays, we get together, we adopt a family. It's very transactional. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about driving past somebody on the side of the road and handing them a thing. I mean, how many of those people have the means to get to a church, have uh, the ability to come consistently without having to compromise, sacrifice, or create a way for mm-hmm. that to happen? A lot of the people that we're wanting to, to serve, if they come to church, they're usually sacrificing something to get here. Yeah. A lot of them like might have to miss work because they're working two jobs. They may not be able to come to a Wednesday night function or whatever. Like. If they can't come and have something that's immediately going to apply to their life when they leave here, it's it's not it's not fruitful for them. Mm-hmm. And so asking them to give something before they're able to receive, 
is not something in this community specifically I feel like is going to be viable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think that what we're all used to is a tradition yeah. of how we have served, and I think I I trust Andy and you know because we align a lot with the end goal of where the church wants to go, and if the community building is where we're wanting to go, I think if we can find ways now to create those opportunities, because we don't want to get a building and then to have to get people to get in it. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as getting a church. I think if we can find ways now to serve the community and refine it to where we get a building, we're really just adapting it to the space. Mm -hmm. I think that is more viable than what doing the continuous one-offs. We can do that from here. We can do that from our house. That doesn't require a building, in my opinion. Those are still one-off situations. I think if we're finding ways to serve the community as they are and meet their needs as a whole, once the community building becomes a thing, we're really just moving it in, Yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, because every community is different. I mean, if we were serving downtown, you know, where the church, you know, many of you went to the old 7th of Washington building. Serving down there would look very different than serving in Baser. And so we've got to serve where God has planted us in the, the place, but in, in the culture that God has planted us with the people that God has planted. People out here, very different than 10 miles down the street or 10 miles the other way. You know, God's put us here for a reason. So I, that's, I agree. Yeah, very good, Rachel. Anybody else? I think there was also something significant to Jesus with your talking about the pride, mm -hmm. with him taking off his robe, too. Yeah. Um, it's like that's what he was doing. Not, you know, it's not me, it's my father. This is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so I think he also um, showed us that as well in your story. Yeah, very good, Pam. Very good. I think something, too, um, <coughs> with sometimes saying your church's name or giving your specific church when you're doing something is it kind of adds the competition of churches and if they really want to search out a christian organization they're going to it's easy to do that these days you just google christian church and they can find one it doesn't have to be yours yeah they're like on every corner exactly um and so sometimes kind of doing that sort of thing kind of just makes it to where you need to come to my church to yeah do. i mean they're going to see that you're showing god's love no matter what church you go to I agree. Yeah, that comes back to that pride thing of my church. My brand is yeah. better than their brand. And we've talked about that. What if God blessed the church down here, but not us? We should be happy because <laughs> God's building the kingdom. If this church gets blessed and not us with people, that's okay. God's building the kingdom. You know, we've got to be big K, kingdom minded, all on the same team, all go in the same direction. We're going to have to get along in heaven. Why can't we get along here? You know, I pray God put some of them people next door neighbors in heaven. <laughs> Something that Jesus was really passionate about, of course, that we be one. Mm -hmm. You know, as he and the Father are one. Absolutely. United and, and to recognize that we are the church, you know, all of us are, are the church. It's not about a building. It's not, a, it's not even about a place, you know. It, it's we are the church. So, Ruby, you said it, you know, personally serving people. We're God's hands and feet here on earth. And I know that for so long, my thought process has been, how can I serve people to get them someplace where they can hear the gospel? <laughs> yeah. But Jesus wants us to be the gospel. Mm. Um, and so I, I love that, that quote, you know, always preach the gospel, sometimes use words, or use words if necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, and words are necessary at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Paul talks about that. Yep. Um, but when Jesus, when John the Baptist was locked up in prison, he sent some of his own disciples to ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, are you the one to come or should we wait for somebody else? And Jesus says, go tell John what you see and what you hear. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, the lame are healed and the good news is preached to the poor. Yep. But so often we think the gospel is something that you just hear. But it's actually something that you see in and hear. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people have heard the gospel, but maybe they haven't just seen it. Yeah. The world's a very different place than it was in 1950. Yeah. And most churches got stuck in 1950. You know, the way we, you know, back to those days, you could knock on somebody's door. They would invite you in for coffee and you could sit down and share your faith. And it was a normal thing. Because people were, grew up with morals then. They knew about Jesus. They knew, 
Today, you have to start from square one with people. There are people who've only heard the name of Jesus as a curse word. You know, they need to see God's love before they hear about God's love. And then you've got to start from somewhere. It's, it's a, please understand what I'm saying. Salvation to them is a process. It takes time for them to get to the point where they can, I accept that. Instead of a, I'm walking down the street, knocking on doors, and I got 13 people today. Well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I don't know. But wouldn't a relationship make more difference in their life? Then they become a disciple. That's what we're commanded to do. We're commanded to make disciples, not make converts. So we've got to reproduce ourselves into them. That takes time, it takes energy, it takes humility, it takes effort, it takes money, it takes all of these things. So, yeah, I'm with you, Marcus. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, he pretty much said the same thing that we say. The church is not the building, it's the mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying a few minutes ago, you can have a building and it's going to sit empty six days a week and only get filled on Sunday morning. What's the purpose? And, you know, what you were saying about we're going to pay money to have a building sit empty for six days. I mean, that's not what the church is. Nope. Uh, the church is not four walls. It's us what you're looking at right here. I mean, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, who wants to, I mean, uh, who wants a pastor to get up on Sunday morning and say, I need you to give more so that we can keep this building? Is that going to inspire you to be a part of something bigger? Or if we got up and said, hey, I need you to give more because we've got a family who we need to make a difference in that's going to lose their house, that's going to, they don't have food for tonight. Which one do you want to give to? I know which one I want to give to. I don't care about a building. I mean, I'd rather give it to make somebody to meet somebody's needs. I'd rather do something for somebody else than just to keep a building sitting open. I think that's just man, we we missed it there. It's not we, but the big we churches missed it there. We have to have our own building. Why? Well, it's got to look this way. Why? And you, we got to have it just for Sundays and maybe a small group during the week. Why? Man, that's a waste of money. That's a waste of kingdom money. I wonder when we get to heaven, how money... I wonder if God's going to say, hey, all that money you should have used for this, how much blood's going to be on our hands of people that should have come to Christ that instead we spent money instead of sending missionaries or making a difference here or making a difference there. How many people are not going to go to heaven because we wasted money on buildings? And I'm not anti-building. Well, I guess it sounds like I kind of am. I kind of am. I'm, I'm anti a building that sits empty six days a week and doesn't make a difference in the community. Yeah, Rachel. I don't mean to keep, you know. That's okay. I have a different relationship with church. Um, my dad and I actually lived in a church for several years of my life. My dad was an addict. I don't know if you all remember. My dad actually lived in the place across the street from here. It's where he passed away in July. We lived in my grandma's gospel tabernacle down off of 10th Street hmm. for years because, you know, he would pawn our stuff. We wouldn't have a place to live and stuff. But we actually lived in one for a lot of years. And so... We ate out of the pantry in the church. We went to church on Sundays, but, like, we physically lived there. Hmm. So, you know, like, I experienced church a lot differently when I was younger and, like, how that church met our needs mm -hmm. immediately, you know, on a daily basis. Yeah. And I think thinking back to that and, like, how, you know, again, not just seasonal, not just around holidays, not just things, like, how we could daily, weekly, we meet the needs of the community. Mm -hmm. And you know, think about the more that we stay on top of things, how by next Christmas, how many families are going to be in a situation where they need to be adopted. Yeah. You know, if we're meeting the community's needs on a daily basis, yep. they might be able to get to have the joy of buying their own Christmas gifts and stuff because they're not struggling elsewhere. Yeah. You know, and so that's my, you know, they helped rebuild us to where my dad could get his own place and could do his own things because they took one of the things away that he couldn't handle on his own. What a novel idea that the church would be open to have somebody come in. Now, every door in most churches is locked, and most of them want to put gates up during the week so that a truck doesn't pull in their parking lot. God forbid the world come onto the church property. I mean, it says, don't, we don't want you, versus come in, we want you. Temporary housing and stuff, like especially with the way that people's cars are getting reposed. You know, you think about how COVID, everyone's getting all this extra money. And then their lifestyle changed around getting all that extra money, and then it went away. Mm -hmm. And then now people's cars are very good. People can't afford their houses. Taxes just went up $1,000 a year. We just got our thing, and some people more than that. People are moving out of Piper and out of Wyandotte because they can't afford taxes to live here right now. Yeah, the taxes here, this will shock you. We moved here from New England. 
the taxes are higher here than where we lived in New England. Well, school lunches, even, they're five, it's five dollars a day to eat us at the school for yeah. so much. My sister in Delaware, there's are 80 cents a day. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and the, the school yeah. sets the prices for the lunches and stuff. But you're talking about, they went on COVID for a year and a half of having free lunch. And then all these families had to go back to adapting to paying for lunch again for their kids, breakfast and lunch. And you, only, you can only make $55,000 as a family of five to qualify for reduced lunch, as a family of five. Mm -hmm. 35 for a family of four to qualify for reduced lunches. Wow. Yeah, so you're talking about all of these needs that are immediate. We went from 4% homeless and displaced up to 11 or 12% after COVID for homeless and displaced families in our community. There's a lot of immediate needs right now yeah. that, that we could be. And that's why I said it can be messy and it can be dirty. Helping people like that, I mean, that, I mean, for Rachel and her dad to live in a church, that was probably an inconvenience for that church. How many churches do you know that would let somebody come in and take one of the rooms and live in? They actually had four apartments. They made, it, they made That's the awesome. rooms into apartments. We had several transitional housing that's that awesome. to the people that lived there. But that's hard. That's, I mean, the word messy I'm using as is being a lot of inconvenience. It, it can be messy. It can be hard to do. But... Church made a difference. Most churches, like I said, they're locked from the time church is over on Sunday and until the next Sunday morning. Or I, yeah. I took a church one time and pastored this church that they told me when I got there, park around the back. Um, when you come in, just make sure the door locks behind you. And when you go in your office, close the door. Your secretary will protect you from people trying to get to you. I opened my blinds, I parked in the front, I moved my desk so people could see me, and I left the door open. I'm fighting telling you the name of that church, but I'm not going to do it. Well, a lot of us went through that sort of thing. I, yeah. mean, I was involved in a church. We borrowed $2 million to build a building we never filled. Never. And, uh, and so the special offerings, everything was always, we got to pay down this $2 million. You know, we got to pay down this debt. And by the time you, d you did your budget and you said, okay, we got to use this much to pay the bill, pay the debt. Utilities were outrageous, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, salaries and everything else. We would literally have ten or $20,000 left for ministry. And that meant like anything else after you paid the bills and such. Mm -hmm. And I, it just was, it was like craziness. And the heck of it is it was justified by, you know, if we have great faith, we'll go big. And I'm thinking, why does it take great faith to borrow money? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can do that. You know, that's how the world does stuff, you know. Uh, but that's how it was cloaked, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yep, yeah, it's we've all seen it. We've all been a part of it, even. So, yep. I mean, how much? Uh, you, I like that twenty thousand dollars left for the year. Um, I don't care. How much money do we have in the bank right now? Um, eighty-five thousand. A church this size, eighty-five thousand dollars in the bank that we can help people with. If we had a building, you know how much money there'd be in the bank? <laughs> We'd be doing giving campaigns to pay the bill. Yep. I, I do want people to know that, that we also support you, and we feel like it's the right thing to do. That's good. He, That's good. he puts a lot of hours in every week preparing for the message and doing all of this. And so we, oh, you know, we support Andy um, on a weekly basis. He's not getting rich, I'll tell you that. But, 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 Amen. Jose, yeah. quick clap for me not getting rich. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we're able to support you and, and help others in the yep. community. That's and that's just because everybody's, there, there are many people in this small little church that are faithfully giving. Absolutely. So, yep. keep Where it your up. treasure is, there your heart will be also. We got a lot of people heart deep in what we're wanting to do. And, and if eventually we, uh, what was the word Rachel used? Um, we take our ministry and we place it in a community center or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, some of that money will go to that, and I'm sure we'll see how it goes. Yeah.
But you know what? As, as I grew up hearing, my dad built his church debt-free. They owed, when they went into that new building that they built, a couple million dollar building, they owed zero. Um, my dad always said, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. Or he used to say, where God guides, he provides. And if it's God's will for us to do something, he'll provide. We don't have to go out and figure out how to do it. He's going to show us. He'll, he'll, he'll take care of it. Or maybe we need to reevaluate. Maybe it's not really what God wants us to do. If he's not providing for it, maybe he's got something else. And we got to be okay with following his plan, not our plan. God doesn't fit in our box. How many times have we talked about that? Blows the walls out because he doesn't fit in a box. He's, you can't put him in a box. Very good. Who's closing us today? Your wife. Oh, boy. I should have stopped a long time ago. We're going to be here a while. No, I'm kidding. Hun, you ready? Can you come out of the back for a moment? You're being paged. Get your Bibles out. We might be, she might start preaching. You don't have to get your Bibles out. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just love you so much. Um, we're so thankful that you give us the opportunity to worship you freely. Um, not a lot of places have that, but we have it here, and so we're thankful for it. Thank you for meeting with us today, Lord, and for the good conversation around serving. Um, Lord, I just pray that you will open our minds and our understanding to what was talked about today. Pray that you would go before us this week and lead us. Pray that you would help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, <laughs> sensitive to the needs of others. Help us to go into this week with our eyes wide open. And look for opportunities, Lord, and pray that you would just give them to us as we ask you um, for it. Lord, I pray that in all of our serving, that you would um, pave the way first, Lord, but then um, also open people's hearts and minds and understanding to your love, Lord. Let us be your love to people in the community this week. Let them see you in us just by the way we behave, by the way we serve them. And then, Lord, ultimately our goal is to reach them for you, Lord, but in your time and however they need, whatever, however much time they need, Lord, to be able to come to you, pray that we wouldn't try to rush ahead of it. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, I pray you um, bless us this week, Lord. Bless everyone who's here. I pray that you would help us to, again, be sensitive to your leading this week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Before you move, we do have an opportunity to serve next week. I'm gone. And Gabe and I and Tim set everything up every Sunday morning. That means Tim is going to be by himself. So Tim needs help next Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock, right here. Um, if you can help Tim, who can come and help Tim set up next Sunday morning at 9? I'm going to put you on the spot and make you raise your hand right now. Okay, Tim needs, Tim needs someone who is electronically apt, technologically okay. You need to be able to use a smartphone or know, know how to do that. So I'm just kidding. Thank you. She's probably the one who could figure the electronics out. I trust her. Very good. Thanks, guys.